called to risk? Yes. Got several yeses. Everything. Absolutely. absolutely. We got an absolutely. There we go. That's taking some risk. Just jump right out there. The apostles were in peril even unto death. So that risk is not always a foolish thing, is it? Unfortunately, in today's society, there's a lot of groupings that put the word foolish risk in front of the word risk. And so they qualify as if all risk is foolish. But we know this is not true. As a matter of fact, the founding fathers of this country took great risks. And, you know, today, look where we are. We're on a, the cusp, the precipice of an election with two people we never thought would even be running for president. Now, if we look at the plan, I'm going to ask a more difficult question. The plan before the foundation of the earth was even laid. You have Jesus, who has not come in physical form yet as a human, coming down to the earth in a physical form. The question that I saw proposed today was, was it risky to send Jesus? In other words, was Jesus at any risk? In other words, let me explain in other words their thought process. In sending Jesus to earth in physical form, was there a risk of failure? We got a well, yeah, could have been. We got a no. He chose the Father's will. But the question is, was there a risk if Jesus came as fully man and fully God yes. that it could have been blown? Uh, not yes. if he was fully God and fully man. <laughs> Are you talking? There's arguments on both sides. I trust you. I, I, I want you to understand. But we also have to know that Jesus is the spirit of God. And there's a scripture that said he's the spirit of what are we talking about Isaiah? Isaiah was a prophet so the very spirit of god is prophecy okay and with prophecy if it's god's prophecy is it going to come true or not yes. it's going to come true 100 percent of the time not 99.9 percent .9 of the time so if we go all the way back to the book of daniel and daniel is interpreting nebuchadnezzar's dream and nebuchadnezzar didn't just ask for an interpretation of the dream he wanted them to actually tell tell him what the dream was and all his soothsayers were like, oh, couldn't you give us a hint? Could you just give us a little bit? No, I need you. If you're really a soothsayer, I need you to tell me what I dreamed last night. Then explain it to me. And they're like, nobody can do that, O king. Oh, there's one. His name was Daniel. And he was locked up. And Daniel trusted in the one who holds everything in the palm of his hand. And Daniel comes up and he says, king, let me pray and seek the face of the one true God. And Daniel did that. And Daniel didn't just get the interpretation. Daniel saw the dream and he reported it back to Nebuchadnezzar in vivid detail. And he talked about the statue and he talked about the kingdoms. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, you saw the kingdoms. And in the very last, remember, there was clay and bronze mixed together and it was shattered by something. What shattered the feet of the statue? The fifth kingdom, which was the Roman Empire that's going to be reactivated. It's going to be rejuvenated. No, it wasn't a rod of iron. Something came from a mountain and crushed it. Ah, a stone, a large stone. And who did this stone represent? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, that Jesus will come. And this is where the rod of iron comes in because the stone came and it crushed it. And that kingdom will have no end. And he that sits on the throne of that kingdom, the rock of our salvation, will rule with an iron rod. Okay. That was already prophesied. So it was prophesied back in the days of Daniel. So could Jesus fail when he came to earth? No, I don't think so. He is fully man, fully God. Now, we, it, I know some of y'all are thinking about this temptation thing. That he was like us and he could be tempted. But it comes to the Greek word for tempt. When we think of temptation, what, what do we mean in the English language? That we can be tempted. Worldly things would do what? Do what? 
I want you to use a different word for attempt. There it is. Say it louder. Entice. Entice. So when we think temptation, we think enticement, don't we? And it may be enticed by the things of the world. It may be enticed by money. It might be enticed by a lot of things. But in other words, we have an inherent weakness where we might be enticed to something. But that's not what the word means in Greek. Okay? When Jesus was tempted, and that means that he was tested. Okay? To be tempted is to be tested. And that he... If we think he was capable of sin, he didn't get enticed to sin. I want you to think about that. If Jesus is God, the very thing that God's not going to do is walk in sin. God is not a liar. He's not a man that he could lie, is he? So how is he going to be enticed to sin? To fall short? You see what I'm saying? What but Jesus, as a man, definitely was tested in the flesh. In the he was being tested. That's right. In the garden, garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is there and he is praying and, and he's praying so fervently. They say that the very concentration ability that he had, the wrestling match that he was going through, do I go and fulfill this, which was discussed even before the foundation of the earth was laid. And it became sweat as drops of blood coming forth from his eyes and coming forth from his brow. And he says, Father, if you could take this cup from me, let it be so. Okay. Was there a wrestling match? Yes, yes. there was a wrestling match. But does that mean that he was enticed to sin? No. No. You see, and there's a difference there. And again, I'm not, I'm not going to say somebody stupid from arguing this, but it's something worth considering. Okay. Could Christ come and fail? In other words, did God do a crapshoot and gamble with Chen and Jesus? No, I don't think so at all. Because we already had a prophecy, and what you're saying is God's prophecy, then it's not true. Okay? Because we have all kinds of prophecy of the Messiah, and there's nothing about the Messiah failing. It's always about the Messiah. We'll come back again, and He will establish a kingdom that will never end. And He will rule with an iron scepter. Okay? And there's only one that can judge rightly. Right? And that's Jesus. You know, unfortunate, we get in God's way a lot of times... Because we really try to take the role of Christ or the role of the Holy Spirit. And we want to punish people. And we, we don't want to walk in forgiveness. And what you're doing is you're saying God is not enough to judge rightly. That you can judge more rightly than God. It's really what we're saying. Okay? If you really want to boil it down. But are Christians called to risk? It hit me yesterday as I was called to go work on a property with a bunch of trees. And I've cut all kinds of trees down, you know, nothing like having a good sharp chain and a good chainsaw, you know, and timber, boom. Well, the first 11 trees was almost no risk, except for me tripping over something, falling with a chainsaw, cutting my leg off, you know, the normal risk that men are okay with. Okay, you know, as you're cutting a tree down, you're saying, I want to make sure I've got an exit point, because you remember Ronnie, Pastor Ronnie talking about he would run. No, it never occurred to me to run, just sidestep, because it's got to fall one direction, okay? But I always leave some room in the back and always notch, and then I cut down from the back to make sure it's going to fall in one direction. And I've even, when I've been more nervous about things, I put tie ropes and topped out and done all that kind of stuff. But then came the last tree, because the first 11 were no big deal, because I could just pretty much fell them in a vacant lot. But then came the one tree that I kept looking at it, and I'd walk and I'd pray. And I'd look at it again from a different angle and I'd walk and pray. And I found myself getting more nervous. I thought there's power wires there, there's cable wires there, there's telephone wires there. And if I put this tree into all those, I'm going to have heck to pay. I mean, the city's going to come after me. And you know, I'm in the city limits as I'm doing this. And I keep looking and I look at this two-story house and I say, that tree's big enough. If it goes the wrong way, it's going to hit the house. Y'all can understand what I'm thinking. And I'm like, oh, but I've done this before. I can do it. I can do it. And I'd get, look, oh, I don't know. I don't really know. I don't know. Is it worth the money? Is it worth, I mean, this, this could be thousands of dollars of insurance, you know. And I'm thinking all these thoughts. And then it hit me. It's like, am I confident that I can fell this tree? Yes. Have I done it before? Yes. Has God been with me before? Yes. 
am, am, am I beyond a reasonable doubt sure I can put it where I want it to go? Yes, I've already topped it out. I, I kept looking, kept praying, and, and As I, I finally said, fine, I'm going to take the risk, I'm going to do it. And I'm, <laughs> change all going to start. <laughs> Maybe this is a sign from God. <laughs> no, 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 God wants me to do it. <laughs> Now, Lord, I'm getting a little bit nervous right here. Am I supposed to cut this tree down? Am I not? Should I really do this? Yes, not just getting deeper. Long story short, it fell just where I wanted it to go. And you could see the sigh of relief as I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not getting arrested today. I didn't knock out power to a whole city block, etc. But we are most definitely called to risk. And I think about my own father. As he got older, he's got a, he's got a multi-story house, but his garage is one story. And as a metal roof, and I mean, well, Sean, you would know this in roofing. It's like a 3 and 12 pitch. That's nothing. I mean, I could dance a square dance on a 3 and 12 pitch. It's just not that steep. And he was like, I, I really need those limbs cut down, but I can't get up on that roof because it's scary. And I'm thinking, okay, it's 12 feet. I mean, I've done far worse things than this. And I get to, he goes, I just don't know how you're up there sawing all these limbs off on that. And I said, Dad, it's really no big deal. And the older he got, the more fearful he has become. And I even remember one day we went to to uh, Taos, New Mexico, and we're going snow skiing. And he wanted to get on the gondola. And I said, Dad, you don't want to go into this gondola because it goes to the top of the mountain, 12,000 feet. Well, he gets on it and he's got these skis and he's like, okay, you skied like twice in your 70 years at the time. And we get to the top of the mountain. And of course, you're looking down thousands of feet of steep slopes and all you see is blue and black. Okay, there ain't no green slopes. These are all pretty difficult slopes. And he gets up there and he starts shaking. He starts getting nervous. Fear starts gripping him. I'm like, Dad, you know, kick your skis off and get on one of these snowmobiles and just ride back down the mountain. I can do it. I can do it. And, and he goes about 50 feet and that's all he got. I'm halfway down the mountain. I see him on the back of a snowmobile going down the mountain. Because <laughs> he decided it wasn't worth the risk. If we apply these concepts spiritually... To our Christian walk. Oh, I think I can do it. I can do it. Well, maybe not. What are you really going to do as far as gospel risk? I want you to think about it that way. What about gospel risk? As a physician, we had to put ourselves in harm's way all the time. Because who do you see in an office? Sick and hurting people. People with the flu, people with diarrheal illnesses, people with pneumonia coughing in your face. You know, you see, I mean, as a nurse, you're going to see sick people. People coming in with infections, people coming in with diseases that can be communicated to you. And so you kind of put yourself in harm way. Police put themselves in harm way. But did Christ want to put us in harm's way? Now, let me talk about two risks. There is an eternal risk. And if you're in Christ, Romans 8, chapter 1, you were wondering where I'm going to get to a scripture. Romans 8, 1 says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of Christ, okay, is now at work, not the law of sin and death. If we were now still under the law of sin then it would bring death because that's what the law brought. But if we're under the law of the Spirit of Christ Jesus, then we've been set free from eternal risk. There's no longer eternal risk, John, is there? Because there's salvation. And what does salvation mean to you? If you can't lose your salvation, then there's no eternal risk, right? Then the question is, when is somebody really saved? All right? So if we're in Christ... In Christ is what the question is. Are we really in Christ? Are we of Christ? Are we partaking of the things of heaven? Have we sold ourselves out so it's no longer I that live, as Paul says, but Christ now lives in me? So it's no longer my life, is it? It's Christ's life. And I had to correct somebody on Facebook this week. It's like, 
You're whining about you and my life and this and my and that. And I said, you know what? It's not your life. If you've given it to Christ and you're in Christ and you want to say there's no condemnation, then quit talking about your life. It's God's life living through you. Okay? It's His life to live. And so, God, what do you want to do through me today? God, I want to walk according to your rules and regulations. Let's look also in Romans chapter 8. We have uh, several other scriptures that apply directly to this. Who is it that condemns? Christ Jesus who died. More than that was raised to life. He's at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? And I'm going to add risk. Can risk separate you from Christ? No. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. This isn't my word. These are Christ's words. Verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor future, nor any powers... Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if we're in Christ, there is no longer any eternal risk, is there? Right? But let me bring out another concept. There is a temporary risk. And if you paid attention to your Christian brothers throughout this world, they are taking temporary risk that is worldly risk right now aren't they to even preach the gospel to even bring in bibles into certain countries right now is forbidden it's verboten okay it is against the law and we have all kinds of patriarchs in the bible who temporarily broke laws who did things with a holy audacity if you think about our missionaries and evangelists right now do they put themselves in harm's way? We had Bill Clowater here not too long ago. Bill is operating in an area within 10 miles of ISIS camps. And he can be beheaded for preaching and proclaiming the gospel. And that wasn't good enough for Bill. Bill goes specifically to the areas controlled by Muslims. And he goes and proclaims the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of Christ that compels him. It is that holy fire that rises up inside of his bones. And he says, I can't play it safe any longer. Because souls are in the balance. We've been playing safe for too long. We've been hiding in our comfort zones. We've been sitting in the tabernacle. We've been sitting in the tent. When God said it's time for the campment to move. God is on the move. There is a generation that's rising up. But it's going to require us to be trailblazers as Christ was the original trailblazer. He showed us the way. Christ didn't play it safe. He was always, always getting the truth out. And you know what? There's some circles where they don't want to hear the truth. There's some circles where speaking the truth may end up in your imprisonment. The seizing of your property or even death. Okay? We're not playing games now. There's an eternal reward waiting. Your eternal risk was taken away by Jesus the Christ. But now we are purposely put back into harm's way. We're taking up our cross and we're following after Him. Look today. People, people are going to see more and more persecution as you make a stand for Christ. We cannot cannot live in comfort anymore we've got to be at a place where doing the will of god is more important than the will of what somebody tells us like if hillary gets in as president and she starts saying that these children are not your children they're actually the community's children and you're going to have to change your beliefs as a christian because we're tired of you being bigots we're tired of you saying there's only one way one path one god one heaven I don't want to hear that, and I'm going to put you in jail. You know what? You better make a decision. You're going to serve God, or you're going to serve this government. Because patriotism is not the same thing as Christianity. There's a huge difference. Now, 
John chapter 11, verse 25 also is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. You don't need to turn there because you all know it by heart. Jesus took away the eternal risk when he said to, to Mary and Martha, do you believe? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Even if your life is required of you earthly, you won't be touched by the second death. There will not be spiritual death for you because you're in me. Amen. In Luke 21, 16, Christ says something rather shocking. He says, Father's going to turn you over. There, your own earthly dad's going to turn you over to those who have earthly power. So you're going to be arrested for my sake. Your mother may turn over state's evidence against you that you have been handing out Bibles. In other words, if you're going to love your mother and father and your brother and sister more than you love me, you're not worthy of the kingdom of God. But you need to realize that I didn't come to make everybody all coherently live happy. He said, I came to bring a sword. And when Christ brings that sword, in other words, there's going to be division in families because there's going to be some who are going to recognize the call of God. And they're going to say, that's a higher authority. That's a higher calling than anything else. But some parents aren't going to want to go that way. Some children aren't going to go that way. And we need to love them. We need to walk in forgiveness. We need to walk in mercy because they're not where we are. They're still bound by the prince of the power of the air. They're still in chains and shackles and they cannot understand things spiritually. So we don't need to get mad. Jesus said, don't get mad. Don't get angry about it. You continue to love. You continue to pray. You continue to act with humility. That takes risk. Okay? Because in our society, a truly humble man is considered what? A coward of the county. Okay? It takes risk to say that, that you're not really a man any longer. Now let's look at a strong woman. Esther, chapter 4. This is an awesome story. We know Queen Esther comes from nothing. She is a Jew. Esther comes right after Nehemiah. Old Testament. Esther chapter 4. Mordecai is her uncle, right? Alright. Chapter 4 verse 10. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law. You know what that law is? They will be put to death. You cannot approach the king unless you've been summoned. And so she's having this debate because they discovered Haman who has a plot to kill all the Jews. All her people. And Esther says, I can't go before the king because I haven't been summoned. As a matter of fact, it's been 30 days since the king has called on me. If I do, there's but one law. And that law is, my life will be required. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the golden scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I've been called to go to the king. And when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. Just because of your position, don't think you're going to escape. You're still a Jew. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will rise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. Even if you do nothing and you keep silent, God's going to provide another way. Because God always does, doesn't he? But you know what? You're still going to die. And who knows? But that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Why have we come to this position in Christ? Why are we co-heirs with Christ in the heavenlies if we're meant to play it safe? Why are we breathed on by Christ and receiving of the Holy Spirit if we're meant just to be safe? Keep quiet. Don't make any ripples. Esther had this before her. 
Even Mordecai is saying, you know what? If you want to be left off the hook, I'm going to leave you off the hook. You still may die, but God's going to rise up, raise up somebody else if you're not going to do this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Think about this godly woman. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. In other words, I'm not sparing myself. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Because I now recognize I can't play it safe even as a queen. You know what? Because there's a higher authority compelling me. And that authority is the Lord God Almighty. That is Elohim. And to do His will is more important to do man's will. And even if this earthly king decrees that I will die, I'm willing to accept that risk. Because I know my Redeemer lives. I know who will deliver me. We cannot live in comfort and safety anymore. We've got to risk some things as God puts it upon your heart. Even as Queen Esther did. In Daniel 3.16 we read the story where three Hebrew boys decided not to bend their knee to the king. But instead to bow to the king of kings. The Lord Jesus Christ. And to say we will not worship this statue O Nebuchadnezzar. We're not trying to be mean or ugly, but we worship a sovereign God. And we are not bowing to a false God. Because we want to be able to ascend the holy hill. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Those with clean hands and an innocent heart who have not bowed their knee to an idol. They knew that scripture. And they said, we, O king, are not going to do this. Throw it through the fiery furnace if you must. Because we know our God has the power to deliver us. And then they said something that inquires incredible faith. Even if our God doesn't deliver us from your hands, we're still not serving you, Nebuchadnezzar. We have a higher calling on our lives. And we all know the end of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego inside the fiery furnace, seven times hotter than ever before. That one as like the Son of Man. In other words, a son of the gods was walking with him. So Nebuchadnezzar didn't know Jesus, but he knew something of sovereign and divinity and awesome power far outstripping Nebuchadnezzar was protecting those three Hebrew boys in this fiery furnace. And he says, I can't contend with that kind of power. But it took faith of these boys to risk it. And I love their faith that they said, our God has power to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we ain't serving you. You know what? Because there's a higher call. And I can hear his voice inside my head. He's speaking to my heart. And I will not bend my knee to you. If we go to Hebrews, and we look at a long list in Hebrews 11, we all know it as the faith chapter, but I'm going to change it. It's the faith and risk chapter. In Hebrews 11. We see uh, verse 4 of chapter 11. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. Took some risk. Cain ended up killing him. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man. When God spoke well of his offering. If you skip down to verse 7. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen. Hadn't ever seen rain. So it's going to, you need to build an ark. I haven't seen rain. But by faith, he was warned. And in holy fear, he built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. No one had ever seen an ark. Do you think people mocked Noah for what he was doing for a hundred years, building this ark, keeping his handly, hand, family all busy? Unlike Hollywood, there was no rock creatures that were fallen angels building the ark. There was no one in his family. And he was, he was mocked for it. You know, he took a risk. Because he respected the opinion of the divine. The opinion of God more than the opinions of man. And he was willing to take that risk. And he did it for over a hundred years and it, God spared his family. Then we look at the next person. By faith, Abraham. 
Listen to this. Can we do this today, modern day? By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as inheritance, he obeyed and went. Now listen to this next phrase. Even though he did not know where he was going. You know, we got to have it all packaged, don't we, Andy? That we're waiting in our house to say, God, all you got to do is come to my house. All you got to do is drop this package and tell me what to do. Tell me where to go. Tell me how it's going to work out. That's what we want, isn't it? Of course we do. We want God to give us a whole booklet and say, John, this is the rest of your life. Read it. That's everything I'm going to have you do. The right decision to make at the right moment. I would love to have a book like that. But we don't have it. Because God speaks that we must have some temporary risk. Are we going to serve God? Are we going to serve mammon? Are we going to serve God? Or are we going to serve the prince of the power of the air? Are we going to serve God with everything? And give up everything that we have. Recognizing we can't save ourselves. Only Christ can save us. And so there's inherent risk. And if you go on and so forth and you read all these people who are the patriarchs of faith, even Moses' parents breaking the law by putting their little baby in the bulrushes in a basket, not knowing what his fate was going to be, but knowing that he represented a Savior. And we all know the story. Even when Moses got of age, he says, I could live sumptuously as the Pharaoh's son. I could continue in the lapse of luxury, but that's not what is burning inside my spirit. There is a higher calling, and my people are crying out. They've been enslaved. These Egyptians are not my people. These Jews are my people, and they're slaves. Why would you leave the palace to go be a slave? Because there was a call of God on his life. That's why. And he was willing to risk it. Are we really willing to have that gospel risk today? Matthew 16, 25 says, For whoever would save his life will lose it. Okay? But whoever loses his life, in parentheses, for the sake of Christ. We can't forget that. Whoever loses his life for Christ's sake shall gain it in the end. They shall find it. Okay? So it would be stupid risk to lose your life for without a purpose. Right? That's just dumb risk to go walk out in front of an 18-wheeler. It's dumb risk working with John here as an electrician to put both hands in a box that's powered, already hooked up, and put both hands. What will happen to me, John? It's foolish risk, isn't it? <laughs> Complete the circuit. That's foolish risk. But if we lay our lives down for the cause of Christ, for Christ's sake, then we will find it eternally and find it in the end. Amen? In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out the 72. And he says, don't take a sandal. Don't take a bag. Don't take any change of clothing. Don't take any food. He sent them out. He says, I'm sending you out as lambs before wolves. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You mean we're going to be facing the wolves and we're like sheep? Mm, I don't know about this, Jesus, and I can't take any supplies with me. There was risk, wasn't there? And you know, the Bible doesn't record that any of the 72 said, forget this, I'm walking away. They were in the presence of the divine. They were in the presence of a man who walked with holy audacity. They were in the presence of God Almighty in the body of of Jesus Christ in the flesh. And there was something about him that was different than any other man. He spoke with power. He spoke with authority. He spoke with a confidence. He spoke in a way that it stirred something inside their souls. So when he said to these 72, look, you're going to go off and you're going to be like lambs out before wolves, but you ain't taking any supplies. I'll be with you. They went. And they came back rejoicing that even the demons were subject to them in Jesus' name. And that's when Jesus had to warn him and say, look, I saw Satan fall from heaven like a shot. Don't let that power go to your head. It's my name and it's my power. But again, we see when Jesus sends out the disciples after he resurrected from the dead and he meets with them and he comes into the upper room. He does something when he gives them the Holy Spirit. You know what Jesus does to the disciples? He breathed on them. 
How many have been breathed on by the Holy Ghost in this room? Come on. How many have been breathed on by the Holy Ghost in this room? But Sean, you haven't been breathed on by the Holy Ghost? Scared to answer. I don't want to raise my hand. Christmas is going to call me out. <laughs> he said, receive of the Holy Spirit. And it's in that empowerment. It is in that dunamis power. It's in that Kratos power. It's in that Ischias power that Christ gives us something that we can now partake in the power in Jesus' name. That we have not only been set free from the penalty of sin, we can be set free from the power of sin reigning in our lives. And we can have effectual lives. We can go forth in His name and conquer so that demons will be subject to us in His name. So that disease will be subject to us in His name. So that those things that are in front of you, that are binding you and stopping you, and that those things that are preventing you, they can be subject to us in Jesus' name. We no longer have to be shackled. The prison door has been opened. But we got to get up and walk out of the prison door. Some of us are content to sit in prison. Even though the shackles have been removed by Christ, you're still acting like a prisoner. We've got to take risk. We cannot live in comfort anymore. God has breathed on us. And because of that, we now have the power of the divine that our abundant life requires living for Christ. And this, by nature, is risky. And it's going to get more risky. I've read the back of the book, guys. It's going to get more risky as you make a stand for Christ. Loving like Jesus is a risky business. Because it requires you to be vulnerable. Now let me finish this by explaining to you the dictionary definition of risk. Being exposed to danger, harm, loss, injury, liability, and demonstrating vulnerability. Do you have to be vulnerable to love? Yes. Talked about this last night, didn't we? In order for Vashon really to meet with his wife in a Christ-like loving way, Vashon's got to be vulnerable. It's got to be. Andy, though he may have been hurt in the past, has got to be vulnerable for him to really love Vaniki at that level that Christ requires. Alicia and I have been hurt in relationships past, but we look at each other and we say, the only way that we can truly love like God has called us to love is if we make ourselves vulnerable. And it's scary, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But that risk is worth it because if you're not willing to risk it, then you're not willing to love. Okay? Because the depth of the love that you can have when you're willing to risk those things is like you're clinging so tightly to a life that you can't save. But we got to release these things. We've got to take risk in Jesus' name. We've got to be willing for Him to become number one and sovereign in our lives. He's got to be able to have dominion in us. We've got to rise up like Esther and to say, it doesn't matter. I'm coming into the presence of the King. And if I perish, I perish. If He saves me, He saves me. It's on Him. But I'm coming with a holy audacity. I'm not walking in fear of man. I'm walking in fear of the God Almighty. And because of that, I am going to move. I'm no longer going to be paralyzed. I'm no longer going to stay in a catatonic state. I'm no longer going to stick to the safe things. I'm going to be willing to hearken unto the voice of the Lord and to step forth into that dark world where people are crying out for a Savior and they don't even know it because they're so bound up. Those who are struggling in addiction, those who are caught up in pornography, those who are caught up in wayward ways, those who are caught up in the dark we have to be the light of the world. We have to be the salt on which they consume, knowing that Christ is pouring it into us so we can pour it out to them. You're not supposed to keep it to yourself. You're supposed to spread it in Jesus' name. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that we are not called to live in comfort in a namby-pamby life. God, that we are called to go forth and to be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. God, knowing that there's no condemnation upon us because we now have life of the Spirit in Christ Jesus. God, we are no longer called to take your job, but we are to relinquish control to you, Jesus, fully, wholly, completely. God, we are to die to self. We are to decrease so that you might increase. Because through us, God, you will accomplish your will. I don't know why you planned it that way, God, because we seem so worthless. But you deemed us worthy when you went to the cross for us. When you cried out our name on that cross, you said we're, we're worthy because you wouldn't die for something unworthy, Jesus. And God, it's not about us, it's about you, but we relinquish control today. In Jesus' name, amen.